Yirmiyahu was a prophet, was a good chaver of mine. Never understood a single word he said, but we helped him to drink his yin. And we always have some mighty fine yin. Singing Tzim Chad Leolam. Kol Ayil Adin now. Sing Chad to the Dagim in the deep blue sea. Sing Chad to you and me. Welcome to the Haftorah Plathora video podcast. For joy to the world is our mission, and talking about the prophets is our method. Hey, that's a new one. Rick, I'm glad you noticed. We're well into the new year, having celebrated on Rosh Hashanah, fasted on Som Gedalia, reflected during the Aser Yomei Tshuva, Aser Yomei Tshuva, the 10 days of repentance, fasted and atoned on Yom Kippur, and been joyous throughout Sukkot. So I thought that we'd change things around a bit for Shemini Atzeret. And I'll get to that in a moment. But first, I'm Larry Herman, sipping some very fine wine, sitting in my sukkah here, and talking haftarah with my very good chaver, the king of cantillation, Rick Muller. How are you doing today, Rick? I'm great. Not as good as you, sitting there in your sukkah, but hey, I'm great, doing my own thing. You are. Rick, you're the most positive and optimistic person I know. A real role model. And while you didn't build a temple like Solomon, you must relate to the Haftarah for Shemini Atzeret, where Solomon has only positive things to say about God and about the people Israel, who are gathered to hear the conclusion of his very long speech at the dedication of the first temple on the occasion of the first celebration of Shemini Atzeret. What do you mean long speech? The Haftarah is only 13 verses. Rick, our Haftarah is only the very end of Solomon's very long discourse which started at the beginning of chapter 8 of the first book of Kings. Our viewers, who may remember our Haftorah our Haftor Plethora episode for the second day of Sukkot, will recall the beginning of the speech where Solomon transfers the ark and the other holy objects from the tabernacle to their intended permanent home in the temple. Wait a minute. We haven't yet prepared, recorded, or published that episode. Rick, I'm doing a little virtual time travel. We'll eventually get to that episode, and our viewers in the future will have their opportunity to view it, and they will understand what I mean. But for those in the here and now, I'll simply say that between the Haftarah for the second day of Sukkot, which covers verses 2 through 21, and this Haftarah, are an additional 33 verses, which comprise a very long and somewhat tiresome speech before Solomon gets to the end, which we are reading for Shemini Atzeret. Wisely, our sages did not include the boring middle part in any of the Haftarot. Virtual time travel, huh? I like that. But how about if we focus on the here and now? This Haftorah is short and sweet, and like you said, it's all very positive and uplifting, except perhaps for the butchering of 22,000 head of cattle and then 120,000 sheep. That's a lot of animals. Rick, Solomon had a lot of mouths to feed at the huge celebration. Think of it as a gigantic barbecue. But I think that the sages kept this Haftorah short in recognition of the lengthy service at the end of the Sukkot holiday, especially since we recite Halal, Yisker, and the special prayer for rain to Filat Geshem. So why don't we keep it short as well and get to the chanting? Good idea, Rick. First, let me just give a brief overview of the text. Up to this point, Solomon has been offering a long prayer to God. He finishes the prayer in verse 40, 53, and then stands up and faces the huge crowd of Israelites who have gathered for this celebration, and in a loud voice, blesses the assemblage. Loud voice is right. No public address system back in those days. True. It does make you wonder. <clears throat> in any case, Solomon reminds the people that God has not failed to deliver on all the promises that he made to Moses. He prays that God will never fail the people in the future. And he prays that the people will do its part to walk in his ways and observe the mitzvot. And then in verse 60, he universalizes his message with the following. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that Adonai alone is God and there is no other. A line that we find in the Elena prayer. Exactly. And I'm sure that we'll get to that when we discuss your chanting. And only then does he initiate the sacrifices that you mentioned. 
It must have taken a long time to get through all of them. Maybe the entire festival of Sukkot. Which is why verse 66 tells us that on the eighth day, Shemini Hatzeret, he let the people go home. So maybe the holiday celebrates the people finally being able to go back to their homes after a very lengthy stay in Jerusalem. Must have been good for business for the tourist industry in Jerusalem. Just as today, since many people, not only Jews, make their way to Jerusalem to celebrate Sukkot. Hey, I thought we were keeping it short and sweet. We are. It's time to chant. Rick, let's divide the chanting into two parts. Let's start with verses 54 through 61, where Solomon concludes his speech. Then we'll conclude with verses 62 through the end, the sacrifices, etc. Perfect. Well, you know my method. I always look for the rarest trope first to see what the Ben Asher family and the Masoretes wanted us to notice. In this half tour, we have that rare and beautiful pazer in verse 65 on the word etechag, which tells us that the sages thought that it was all about the holiday, the chag. Rick, it seems like that's kind of starting at the end. Don't you have anything to tell us about the trope or text at the beginning of the Haftarah? Of course. I was just reminding you of my method, and the pazer was near the end. But sure, we've got a lot to talk about at the beginning. Like, how about right at the beginning, the first words of verse 54? We start right off with the Munach, the Garme, separating the first two words and a Revia on Solomon's name. The translation in the eights is, and it happened when Solomon finished. Now, everyone knows the word Kechalot, think Friday night Kiddush, or the end of the creation story. It starts, with Torah trope there. The heavens and the earth were finished, and all they contained, and God ceased on the seventh day. So we've got the root of the word twice, Vayachulu, were finished, and then Vayachal, and he ceased. So the Haftar is telling us, finally, thank goodness, <laughs> Solomon finished his very long and boring speech. And the Revia on Solomon's name tells the, that he turned the attention from the heavens above down to the people on earth, since the melody of the Revia descends. Holy cow! Ricky got all that from the trope on the first three words? Sometimes. The holy cows come later, when we describe the sacrifices. And I have more. Verse 55 starts with two Zakef Kadols, which is a very rare thing. Vayamod, vayivarech, the line and the two dots next to it. The first to emphasize that Solomon stood up from his kneeling before God, and the second to emphasize that he next blessed the people. More great stuff. But Rick, I noticed that the very next verse starts, Baruch Adonai. So is he blessing the people, or is he blessing God? I think Solomon's blessing of the people includes the statement that God should be blessed who has fulfilled all of his promises. It's kind of like the song from Fiddler on the Roof when Golda is offering her Sabbath blessing to her children. May the Lord protect and defend you. May he always shield you from shame. May you come to be in Israel a shining name which is very similar to the text of verse 57, which follows. Yes, it is. But I want to focus on the last two words of verse 57. Ve'al May God never abandon us or forsake us. Rick, for what it's worth, Alter translates it as forsake us first and abandon us second. Same words, different order. But it calls to mind... The, and to my mind, the Shema Koleinu that we sing as part of the High Holiday Amidah, when we ask God not to abandon us, we use several synonyms for Ya'azvenu, but not Yitshenu. Instead, we have Al Tashlichenu and Al Tirchak Mimenu. So the plead for God not to abandon us has a flip side in verse 59, which clearly the sages really liked, since he provided a fair amount of trope techniques which we'll hear when you chant that verse. The entire verse is translated as follows. 
And may these words that I pleaded before Adonai be near, Adonai, our God, day and night, to do justice for his servant and justice for his people, Israel, day after day. I love that there's a Kadmava Azla and Riviyah on the first three words, highlighting that Solomon pleaded with God on behalf of the people. Then there's a Tavir on the word Krovim, which means to come near, which sounds to me like Solomon is trying to nestle himself next to God. And then we have a Munach Lagarme just before the parallel phrases, justice for his servant, meaning Solomon, and then justice for his people, Israel. Right. Solomon is identifying himself with the people. But then comes another great verse, verse 60. It starts off with the Yativ after the Revia. Leman da'at on the word knowledge. The entire phrase can be translated as so that all the peoples of the earth may know that Adonai is our God. There is none else. The Tavir on the word da'at emphasizes the true understanding that the other peoples of the world will come to have. It'd be nice. That phrase, Ki Adonai Hu Elohim Ein Od, should be familiar also as the ending of the first paragraph of the Aleinu, and also part of it as the last verse that we recite and repeat seven times at the conclusion of the Yom Kippur Neila service. I'll only add that Solomon knew his Torah, since this phrase is repeated twice in chapter 4 of Devarim, uh, uh, Deuteronomy. Rick, time to chant? Time to chant. The text is found starting on page 1263 in the Eitz Chaim Chumash, and also on your screens, where you can see the beautiful graphics that Norm has prepared for our viewers. I'll start with the bracha. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher kichana b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu la'asok v'divrei Torah. Amen. Vayihi kechalot shlomo lehit palel el Adonai et kol hatzfila v'hatchina hazot kam milifne. Mizbach Adonai Mikroa Albir Kav Vechapav Prusot Hashamayim Vaya Amod Vayevarech Et Kokehal Yisrael Kogadol Lemor Baruch Adonai Asher Natan Menucha Leamo Yisrael Kechol Asher Diber Lo Nafal Davar Echad Mikol Devaro Hatov Asher Diber Beyad Moshe Avdo Yehi Adonai Eloheinu Imanu Kasher Haya Imavoteinu Aya Azvenu Vealyichenu Lehatod Levavenu Elav Lalechet Vechodrachav Velishmor Mitzvotav vechukav umishpatav asher tziva et avotenu v'yiyu dvarai ele asher itchananti ifne Adonai krovim el Adonai Eloheinu Yomam Valayla La'asot Mishpat Avdo Umishpat Amo Yisrael Devar Yom Biyomo Leman Da'at Kol Ame Ki Adonai 
Hua Elohim Ein Od Vehaya Lavavchem Shalem Im Adonai Eloheinu Lalechet Bechukav Velishmor Mitzvotav Kayom Hazeh Great stuff, Rick. What have you got for us in the last part of the Haftarah? Well, we've got the Pazer near the end, of course. But verse 62 starts with the lone Zakif Katon. An In a verse that translates as, The king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before Adonai. I have previously commented on that lone Zakif Katon. I think it's a sign of modesty. Perhaps it's telling us that Shlomo is being humble here by coming down to sacrifice with the people. Then in verse 63, we've got these huge numbers of animals being slaughtered, as we mentioned earlier. Not to belabor the point, but these numbers cannot be taken literally. Alter calls them a fantastic embellishment. Just the blood alone would have flooded the temple and turned it red. Let's not get so graphic, please. But I do think that the zarka on the word hashlami means something. In this case, it's referring to a specific type of sacrifice, how important it was, sometimes called the peace offering or the well-being offering, which is a voluntary offering of thanks. So maybe we're to understand that these sacrifices were being made freely and not as a result of any obligation due to transgressions. I like that. And then we have Kidash HaMelech in verse 64 with your favorite Kadmavi Azla, the king sanctified or he made holy. The entire process of all these sacrifices must have been quite dramatic. Oh yeah. And now finally comes your favorite, the Pazer in verse 65 on the word Et Hechag. Yeah, and it's preceded by the drama of a Munach and then another Munach and then the Munach Lagarme leading up to the Pazer. To me, this sounds like a grand procession from the Temple Mount at the end of all these sacrifices. And that's followed by the Talisha Ketana and Kadmavi Azla again. Imo Kaha Gado, meaning in the grand assemblage with him, again stressing the togetherness of Shlomo and the people. And just in case you missed which day of the festival this was, the last verse starts with Bayom HaShmini, ergo Shmini Atzeret. Rick, take us home. V'hamelech v'cho Yisrael imo zovchim zevach lifne Adonai v'yizbach shlomo Et zevach ashlamim, asher zavach ladonai, bakar esrim ushnaim elef, vetzon meav esrim alef, vayach nechu et bet adonai, hamelech. Shlomo <laughs> Vaitahi et echag, Vecho Yisrael imo, Kahal gadol, Milevo 
Nachamat Ad Nachal Mitzrayim Lifne Adonai Eloheinu Shivat Yamim Veshivat Yamim Arba Asar Yom Bayom Hashmini Shilach Etam Vayivarachu Etamele Vayelachu Leoho Lehem Smechim Betov Elev Al Kol HaTova Asher Asa Adonai Le David Avdo O Yisrael Amo Great stuff, Rick. Thank you. As, as always, thanks to Norm Gar for all the beautiful graphics, music, text, and editing. Don't forget to write us with your thoughts and comments. Our emails are below. And if you like our Zoomcast, please forward the link to your friends and family. Next week, We'll, be, we'll have a reprise of our episode for Parshat Bereshit, and then new episodes for Noah and Lech Lecha. In the meantime, we wish you all a Chag Sameach. Hi, Millie. Bye, Millie. Chag Sameach. Hey, Chag Sameach. Can you wave bye? Say bye. Smile. Bye. Yeah.